Welcome to Coventry, the second largest city in the West Midlands, and the rather underrated home of one of the most diverse ranges of architecture and landmarks you'll find in Britain. With a history that includes everything from the legend of Lady Godiva to immense industrial prowess and a groundbreaking post-war rebuild, we'll dive into the story of Coventry as we walk around the heart of the city on this gorgeous sunny day. However, we begin inside the city's most famous landmark of all, the ruins of Coventry Cathedral. These expansive ruins once formed part of the 14th century Church of St Michael, once upon a time one of England's largest parish churches and which was designated a cathedral in 1918. However, just 22 years after gaining cathedral status, Coventry Cathedral was devastated by one of the most infamous bombing raids on Britain during the Second World War. On the night of the 14th of November 1940, this proud cathedral was just one of the many targets that fell victim to the worst air raid by the Luftwaffe during the so-called Coventry Blitz. 515 German bombers made their way towards this city, intent on destroying its significant industrial infrastructure, but the damage spread far further across Coventry than that. The cathedral here, which was once topped by a glorious old roof, was bombed almost to destruction, while over 4,000 homes around the city were completely destroyed and 568 people were killed in one night. In causing damage to around two-thirds of all the buildings in central Coventry, that air raid of the 14th of November 1940 would come to shape the city's future, as Coventry rose from the ashes as it was rebuilt as a groundbreaking, modern industrial centre. We'll explore that as we continue our walk around the city, but the legacy of Coventry and its cathedral here before the bombs fell is also fascinating. Despite being well known nowadays for its 19th and 20th century industrial heritage, Coventry has been a place of major settlement for much, much longer. For example, in the 14th century, when this church was built, Coventry was the fourth largest city in England, and as such, this was a hugely significant place of worship. But even after this church was almost entirely destroyed in the Second World War, the ruins of Coventry Cathedral took on a newly significant meaning, with its surviving ruins being left in place as a garden of remembrance and a reminder of the horrors of war. Here where the altar once stood, we can see a replica of the charred cross, which was fashioned in the aftermath of the bombing from two wooden beams that had fallen onto the ground in the shape of a cross. The charred cross is one of many memorials in the cathedral created after the bombing but the towering cathedral spire we can see opposite is also a memorial to Coventry in its medieval heyday. The spire is the third tallest cathedral spire in England, after Salisbury and Norwich cathedrals, and after somehow having survived the Luftwaffe's bombs in 1940, it's yet another marvel that tells us of the incredible legacy of this part of Coventry. Meanwhile, looking towards the northeastern corner of the old cathedral, there lies one of the only parts of the cathedral's interior to have survived the bombing, an effigy tomb of the first Bishop of Coventry Cathedral after it gained the status in 1918. Along with the tomb and the many new statues and monuments erected within the cathedral ruins, you could spend a long time simply exploring what was once the interior of one of England's great churches. However, we're now going to make our way out of the ruins of Coventry Cathedral through the old church's northern walls, where we'll see that it's neighboured by a strikingly modern building, the new Coventry Cathedral, which was opened in 1962. Now, as we've explained, the ruins of the 14th century church turned cathedral were not demolished, but rather left in place as a poignant war memorial. This was in contrast to the fate that befell many ruined buildings in the Second World War, which were typically demolished and rebuilt in a modern style. And the person that we have to thank for retaining the ruins of Coventry Cathedral is one Sir Basil Spence, who was placed in charge of rebuilding the cathedral after the war. 
Spence insisted that the remains of the old cathedral be kept in place, and he decided to build a radical, brand new cathedral for the city just next door. Here on the city's university square, we're taking in one of the greatest views in Coventry, with the impressive ruins of the old cathedral on our left, and its replacement to our right. The new cathedral was built over four years from 1958 to 1962, in a modernist style, and is completed with features such as the huge angel sculpture we can see here on its east wall, known as St Michael's Victory of the Devil, symbolising the triumph of good over evil. The sculpture is one of a number of enormous features that make up the immense new cathedral. But here outside the enormous cathedral building, we find a humble statue of the so-called Coventry Boy, depicted holding a roll of paper aloft, much like a knight holding a sword. The paper is meant to represent an apprenticeship certificate that granted the Coventry Boy entry into the city's historically thriving engineering sector. Significantly, the Coventry Boy statue stands just outside Coventry University, which began life in the mid-20th century as part of the city's busy industrial sphere, providing students in Coventry with a high level of training in a wide range of technical skills. Today, Coventry University is said to be the fastest growing university in the UK, and it interestingly came about a few years after it was suggested by the Cathedral Bishop in the 1940s. Of course, Coventry, as a city with an illustrious heritage of industry and engineering, prides itself on the many technical innovations that were born in the factories around the city. In the 1960s, Coventry was famously the heart of car manufacturing in Britain. But even before then, the city was a hub of production for bicycles, jet engines, communications equipment, and so much more. The strikingly modern cathedral that was built at that time is a symbol of how that breadth of industrial production helped Coventry to become a hugely prosperous city in the 1950s and 60s, emerging from the spectre of the Second World War in triumphant fashion as it went on to become one of the busiest and wealthiest population centres in Britain. However, as we've mentioned, Coventry was a highly prosperous place long before heavy industry and modern engineering were even in their infancy. As we mentioned briefly, Coventry was one of the largest and most important cities in England during the Middle Ages. While the city can claim to have its origins in Roman settlement around 2,000 years ago, it was from the 11th century onwards that the Coventry we know today was born. In the year 1016, a small Saxon nunnery was destroyed by the armies of the Danish King Canute on his way to taking the English throne. A couple of decades later, in 1043, a monastery was built in its place by the Earl of Mercia and his wife, Lady Godiva, who we'll talk more about later. The new monastery, built around this area, was the first major landmark in Coventry, and was later followed by a castle, around which a civilian settlement began to develop. From this civilian settlement came a local market, that was held just outside the monastery. Over time, Coventry developed from a small, insignificant village into a major market town, home to a large community of merchants who would typically meet on Bailey Lane, just to the right of the old cathedral spire here, in St Mary's Guildhall. The Guildhall, which is currently undergoing restoration, was the headquarters of the local merchants' association, or guild, and was built nearly 700 years ago in the mid-14th century. Just here, meanwhile, we can see the old county hall, which dates from 1784, and, as well as historically playing host to Warwickshire County Court, is the last remaining public building from the 18th century in Coventry. And just next door to the old county hall stands the majestic Holy Trinity Church, which stands proudly as one of the three spires of Coventry, alongside the old cathedral and the remains of nearby Christchurch. Holy Trinity is the last medieval church in Coventry that remains fully complete, initially built all the way back in the 12th century, and featuring another strikingly tall spire, yet another symbol of Coventry's prowess in the medieval era. So just 10 minutes into our walk around Coventry, 
We've already seen examples of buildings from the 12th, the 14th, the 18th and the 20th centuries. On a walk around Coventry in the modern day, you can find architecture from pretty much every era of the last thousand years. And that makes this a truly unique city to take a walk around, as you pass through different periods of history with each corner you turn. But now that we've made our way out of the oldest and most historic part of Coventry, we find ourselves in surroundings that might be more akin to what first springs to mind when you think of this city. While there's a real diversity of architecture in the area we've been exploring so far, the majority of central Coventry was indeed built after the Second World War, during which time developers sought to do away with the cramped old streets of medieval Coventry and replace them with spectacular, wide open spaces befitting of a city of the 20th century. That brings us on to Broadgate, the city's immense central plaza. Thought to take its name from the old gate that gave entry to Coventry Castle from the west, Broadgate has had many different faces over the seven decades since the end of World War II. Once home to an island circled by traffic, later a grassy square, and today a vast paved area surrounded by shops. But at the heart of Broadgate here stands a majestic statue of Lady Godiva, undoubtedly Coventry's most famous resident of all. A noblewoman of the 11th century, Godiva was the wife of the Earl of Mercia, with whom she established the monastery that followed the nunnery destroyed by King Canute. Now according to legend, Godiva's husband was levying harsh and oppressive taxes against those living around the monastery, and so Lady Godiva requested that he reduce these taxes. He refused, saying that he would only reduce the taxes if Godiva rode through the town of Coventry naked. So, famously, Lady Godiva did just that, riding on horseback through Coventry naked in protest of her husband's taxes, giving birth to a famous legend that persists to this day. But while it's undoubtedly a famous tale, is the story of Lady Godiva's ride through Coventry actually true? Well, we'll pick that story up in a couple of minutes, but we're now going to make our way off Broadgate into Coventry's upper precinct which is arguably the most striking example of how the city was completely transformed by modern development after the Second World War. Along with its partner the Lower Precinct, the Upper Precinct forms part of what was at the time of its construction in the 1950s a pioneering step in town planning. Now Coventry's precinct, much like Broadgate and so much of the city, has continued to evolve since it was first built around 70 years ago. But as we walk down this lively main boulevard, we can see the thinking that developers had as they sought to establish a brand new blueprint for the modern British city. With much of Coventry devastated by the bombings of the Second World War, developers had a clean slate to work with and aimed to transform the way in which people lived, worked and shopped in city centres. In contrast to the traditional British high street, the upper precinct here was a wide open boulevard lined with shops, but which crucially removed cars from the mix, intended to turn the shopping experience into a more relaxing, leisure-like pursuit than a noisy, busy chore. Complete with fountains, dead straight streets and angular, precise architecture that at the time was straight out of a sci-fi movie, the precinct was the first modern shopping centre to be built on such a large scale in Europe. And as you'll have seen for yourself in many different towns around the country, it proved hugely influential. Standing at the heart of the precinct with the shopping area's showpiece fountain just before us, this kind of environment is nowadays a pretty familiar sight in town and city centres across Britain. Although a roof was added to the lower precinct there as trends evolved in the 1980s towards the popularity of indoor shopping centres. Nowadays, the precinct is an intriguing blend of indoor and outdoor shopping, which feels both familiar and still futuristic to visitors to Coventry. But while the precinct's design had an undoubtedly enormous influence on town planning in Britain, not every part of its blueprint caught on. For example, as we walk back up towards Broadgate now, on either side of the street here we can see two floors of shops, but the upper floors aren't exactly that busy. 
That's because, when the precinct was first laid out, an extra floor of shops was included to allow for more retail space. But as escalators weren't widespread at the time, shoppers found it generally exhausting walking up and down stairs all the time with their bags. As such, the upper floor of the precinct has been often neglected in the past, in contrast to the beautifully arranged main street we're walking along here. But as we pass by a statue of the Naiad, a popular local landmark depicting a woman met by its sculptor, George Wagstaff, on holiday back in the 1960s, I promised earlier that we'd delve into whether the tale of Lady Godiva's naked horseback ride is true or not. And in short, it probably never actually happened. Though a fantastic tale that's endured through the centuries, the legend actually originated about a hundred years after Lady Godiva died, emerging in writing by a monk who was notorious for, let's call it poetic license. The story of Lady Godiva continued to live on, however, and in the 16th century, around 500 years after the event was purported to have taken place, a famous new twist and side character was added to the tale. As we know it today, the story goes that as Lady Godiva rode through Coventry naked, only covered by her long hair, the townspeople averted their gaze in solidarity with her and to preserve her modesty. This was everybody except for this new side character, a man named Thomas, who couldn't resist taking a look at the noblewoman with no clothes on. Because of this, in the story, Thomas is usually referred to as Peeping Tom, and that's exactly where the name for anybody who engages in voyeurism comes from. This clock on Broadgate usually has a little model of Peeping Tom catching a glimpse of Lady Godiva, though it only comes out on the hour. Now just along from the impressive 20th century precinct and the wide open Broadgate, we're passing by a grand bank that was built in the late 1920s, with its facade designed in the style of a beautiful Greek temple. It's neighboured, meanwhile, by another impressive bank, this one a work of 1932. Both of the banks managed to survive the bombings in the Second World War, and as we walk onto Coventry High Street, you'll notice that there are a number of other pre-war buildings too. As we mentioned, at least two-thirds of buildings in central Coventry suffered damage during the Luftwaffe's air raids, but not all were damaged beyond repair. While many were indeed demolished to make way for the brand new precinct and other elements of the modern town plan, a number were thankfully retained, with High Street here featuring an eclectic range of different periods of 20th century architecture. Now although it's lined with mostly 20th century buildings, the High Street here is probably the oldest street in Coventry, historically serving as part of a longer route that passed through the city between east and west. Once upon a time a bustling place of trade, particularly before the war, the High Street is rather more still nowadays, linking Broadgate with one of the most impressive buildings in the whole city, the Council House. Opened back in 1920, this expansive Elizabethan style building was designed to serve as the new headquarters for Coventry City Council, to replace St Mary's Guildhall on Bailey Lane beside the old cathedral. With the development of heavy industry around the city, Coventry's population exploded around the turn of the 20th century, meaning that the old 14th century Guildhall was in no way suited to the needs of a city of hundreds of thousands of people. Between 1880 and 1940, Coventry's population skyrocketed from around 50,000 to over 200,000, and today, the city is home to as many as 370,000 people making it the 11th largest in the UK. The Grand Council House, then, is an eye-catching symbol of modern Coventry, having replaced a row of small shops to create an enormous new administrative HQ that's full of Coventry heritage. Like much of the city centre, it too suffered damage in the air raids during the war. Meanwhile, the building's exterior is adorned with statues and carvings of numerous historical Coventry figures including Lady Godiva, her husband Leofric, the Earl of Mercia, and more, as well as the city's distinctive coat of arms above the building's entrance. Coventry's coat of arms famously depicts an elephant carrying a tower on its back, the tower being Coventry Castle. 
There are lots of different theories for the symbolism of Coventry's elephant. Some suggest it's a symbol of strength, while others say that it's actually an allegory for the patron saint of England, St George. The enemy of the elephant was traditionally said to be the dragon, and so St George, who famously slayed the dragon, is possibly represented by the elephant in Coventry's coat of arms. By the way, there's a legend that knows St George as the Coventry Kid. It's said that the medieval knight was born and died in Coventry, which, during his time, was one of the most important cities in England. In truth, of course, St George was more than likely born thousands of miles away in modern-day Turkey, though Coventry does still hold some nice St George's Day celebrations every year on the 23rd of April. We now find ourselves on Hay Lane, one of the oldest lanes in the city, and looking at a pair of brick-fronted buildings that actually date from the 16th century, still being kept upright by a timber frame. Over on the other side of the cobbled Hay Lane stands another historic Coventry landmark, the Golden Cross Inn, which was built over 400 years ago in 1583. Though much restored over the centuries, this fetching pub is one of the best preserved timber framed buildings in Coventry, which somehow survived the devastation of the bombs that almost entirely destroyed the city's cathedral just a few feet away. Passing by the cathedral ruins once again, it's remarkable that so many historic buildings remain standing in Coventry city centre, particularly given how much the city has changed over time. Not only did the Luftwaffe's bombs do heavy damage to a city which once had the same oldie woldy streets and lanes as cities like York, but the rapid development of industry and the rise of the local population also threatened many of Coventry's oldest buildings. Thanks to the efforts of numerous architects, history enthusiasts and council workers in the mid-20th century, however, many of Coventry's most characterful pre-war buildings were retained, and have since been kept in beautiful condition. Now as we pass by the city's spectacular new cathedral, which is actually one of the newest in the world, we find ourselves approaching a row of distinctive 18th and early 19th century townhouses, which actually occupy the site of the original monastery founded by Lady Godiva and her husband back in 1043. The remains of the monastery, known as St Mary's Priory, lie about 4 metres or 13 feet beneath the ground here. Although, as we'll see in a moment, city centre excavations will allow us to inspect the remains of that nearly 1,000-year-old monastery for ourselves. For a city so well known for its recent industrial legacy, Coventry is hugely underrated in Britain for its range of architecture and historic ruins. But just last year, in 2021, Coventry was designated as the UK City of Culture, which gave the city the opportunity to host events designed to draw people to Coventry, as well as to further celebrate its illustrious history and to regenerate a city centre that fell on hard times in the late 20th century as industry declined. We'll talk more about that shortly, but here we find ourselves standing atop the Priory Garden, an excavated area of the city which features the fairly extensive remains of St Mary's Priory, founded nearly 1,000 years ago. As we spoke about earlier, the Priory here was the first major building that put Coventry on a path to medieval prosperity, followed by the castle nearby, and then the major civilian settlement that grew outside these walls. Most of the Priory was buried beneath the ground over time, while Coventry Castle, built in the 11th century around the Bailey Lane area by the old cathedral, was fairly short-lived. It was mostly demolished in the 12th century, with the exception of one tower, Caesar's Tower, which was interestingly where Mary Queen of Scots was once held prisoner back in 1569. Here meanwhile, we're looking up at a majestic black and white timber framed building that is thought to be the only part of the old priory complex that still survives in its full form today. These are the Lichgate cottages, built in the 1410s and which stood within the walls of the old priory before being significantly extended in the 19th century. Today, the extended Lichgate cottages are mostly used by one of the most popular pubs in Coventry, the Flying Standard, 
which takes its name from a model of car that was made in Coventry through the first half of the 20th century. The Flying Standard, manufactured by the Coventry-based Standard Motor Company, was built in factories outside the city centre here in the 1930s and 40s, but it was just one of the hundreds of thousands of cars that were built in Coventry over the years. We mentioned earlier that Coventry had industrial roots in the manufacture of bicycles, but in the last few years of the 19th century, many bicycle factories in the city switched their focus to producing motor vehicles. By the 1920s, car production in Coventry really began to take off, as the motor vehicle became more widespread and factories were able to produce thousands of cheap, easy to operate cars for the average person. Though the car industry was interrupted by World War II, when factories switched to producing machinery and ammunition for the war effort, the post-war years saw the city's car production go through a golden age, so prosperous that Coventry came to be known as Motor City. At the height of Motor City's heyday, a plethora of car companies had operations in Coventry, including the likes of Jaguar, Hillman, Morris, Triumph and Peugeot. Iconic cars like the Jaguar E-Type and the Triumph TR6 were made right here in Coventry, but the spectacular success of Motor City sadly didn't last forever. In the 1970s, Britain's car industry was overtaken by other countries like Japan, while domestic car companies like British Leyland began to fall into disarray. This caused a dramatic decline in the industry across the country, and Coventry, as Motor City, was hit particularly badly, by the 1980s finding itself with one of the worst unemployment rates in Britain as car factories closed up shop. But here we find ourselves beside the city's busy Pool Meadow bus station, which was first built back in 1931. It's neighboured by the iconic Whittle Arch, a much newer city landmark of 2003. And all put together, we find ourselves here at a junction that captures an interesting dynamic of this city's history. Now far away from the historic core of Coventry, this more modern area features memorials to the city's spectacular engineering legacy. This statue, for example, depicts Sir Frank Whittle, for whom the arches above us are named. Whittle, born in Coventry, is most famous as the inventor of the turbojet engine, and this statue depicts him watching a test flight of the first British jet-engined aircraft back in 1941. The impact of Whittle's invention of the turbojet engine was significant, having engineered a brand new form of engine that was highly efficient at much higher speeds. Although turbojets nowadays are much different to Whittle's original plan, his invention helped to lay the foundation for supersonic aircraft, such as the world-famous Concorde airliner. With its heritage of bicycles, cars, buses and planes, it's no surprise then that Coventry is home to the largest collection of British-made road transport, here at the Coventry Transport Museum, which opened back in 1980. The museum is home to a wide range of exhibits, from many of the cars produced in the factories during the heyday of Motor City, including an Austin Metro once owned by Princess Diana, and much, much more. But from Coventry's modern industrial heritage, we're now approaching the end of our walk around this magnificent city with one of its oldest landmarks. This is the Swanswell Gate, built around 1440, and which was one of 12 gatehouses that punctuated the old city walls that surrounded medieval Coventry. Originally, this was named Priory Gate, as it gave access to the land of St Mary's Priory. Although much later on in history, this gatehouse went on to be used as a cottage in the 19th century, and later on, a shop, an artist's studio, and a police station. But what happened to the old city walls? Well, originally, the walls made a more than two-mile circle around Coventry, and were regarded as the strongest city fortifications in medieval England outside London. However, during the English Civil War of the 17th century, Coventry found itself catching the ire of the monarchy, when they backed Oliver Cromwell's parliamentarians and famously snubbed King Charles I by denying him entry to the city. Although the parliamentarians won the Civil War, when the monarchy returned in the 1660s, 
King Charles II ordered that Coventry's walls be destroyed. And it's here that we now come to the end of our walk around Coventry, a city full of spectacularly underrated history and heritage. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you're now looking forward to making a visit to Coventry for yourself in future.